All right, guys, welcome to a brand new video. My name's Steve, and if you've been following along, you'll know that this V12, or what remains of it, came out of this 8 Series, because despite me spending an absolute fortune on this engine over the last few years in my kind of refurb, it refuses to run properly. So I kind of covered the entire disassembly in the last video, so everything has been taken off the engine, and all that we've got left here is basically the bottom end. Both cylinder heads have been posted today, actually, to Topmar Motor Works in Poland. So they're going to do a full rebuild of both cylinder heads. The cylinder heads were pretty poor, so I'm pretty sure that was the cause of the poor running of this engine. And I don't really have a plan of attack for this video. I'm not sure where this video is going to end up, to be honest with you, because this is kind of day one of, I suppose, the further disassembly and then the full reassembly of the engine. So I'm trying to determine what to do in terms of what to replace. Um, all I've done in this, or sorry, in the last day or so, I suppose, is just basically clean the pistons. That's all I've done since the previous video. As you can see, they're spick and span. I basically just used a very light degreasing spray and a very soft bristle toothbrush. Gave them a scrub up um, about 20 seconds per piston and cleaned them up really, really nicely. So you can see it was a very um, unabrasive, uh, uninvasive cleaning, basically. So they cleaned up very well and very quickly. So I don't want to go replacing parts that I don't need to. Again, rod bearings, crank bearings, piston rings. I just need to examine everything, see what the condition is. These M70s are incredibly well engineered. You can have 150, 200,000 miles on them, strip them apart, and all the bearings look brand new. So it's, it's well documented that these engines are rock solid. So again, I don't want to do it a disservice by replacing parts that are Essentially, this should be the same spec, but again, you always run the risk of replacing parts that don't need to be replaced and making things worse. So, yeah, I suppose next step is to get these pistons out and, and examine all the components that I just mentioned, and we can go from there. These head gaskets have been annoying me, so I want to get these removed first. I've just written a number on each piston, one through six and then seven through 12, so I know which one is which, and I can go back in the same location. So time to rotate this upside down, and we can take a look at the rod bearings. Okay, so I'm gonna remove my first rod cap. This is actually piston number 12, and both of these bolts need to be removed, and of course, they cannot be reused. And there's a tremendous amount of torque required to undo these. And there's the first one. <laughs> wow, that looks absolutely immaculate. That didn't help. A very small bit of wear. Otherwise, immaculate. Now I'm gonna remove this piston. Gotta put a small bit of tape on the inside edge because the rod actually wants to naturally fall over this way against the cylinder wall. So I'm just gonna do that now. Okay, the piston is now free, and it should slide down fairly easily. And as I say, that's piston number 12. And that is the condition of this piston. So there is 133,000 miles on this engine which I forgot to mention. And once again, let's give this a light rub. And there's certainly a bit more noticeable wear on that one, but again, absolutely nothing to
the last one. Finally, we have all of the pistons removed and they're nicely laid out on the table here, as you can see. The bolts are just there for effect. They're going to be thrown in the bin straight away. We've got what bank 12 through seven facing us here and then the opposite side facing outwards. I've kept the orientation of each cap so they don't get uh, misplaced and twisted around incorrectly. And interestingly, there seems to be quite a bit of wear, not a, a huge amount of wear, but there's very obvious wear on the rod side of every single bearing. But interestingly, piston 12 and six have virtually no wear, but every single other one has very similar uniform levels of wear. So we're just gonna pop out those bearings now and show them to you in isolation. All right, so a few minutes later, and we have all of the bearings laid out. And in pretty much every instance, the left side one is the rod side, so the piston side, and the right side is the cap side. And we've pretty much universal wear on all of the rod sides, as you can see. Take a look at that. And then to contrast that, the right side, the, cops, the cap side is in very good nick. But yeah, those left side ones, not good at all. There's a hell of a bit of a wear on this one, as you can see. So yeah, these are definitely getting replaced. And while I was in there, it would be foolish of me not to examine the actual crank bearings also. So I've popped off uh, two center caps here. And sure enough, more money. These are not in good condition, as you can see. These also need to be replaced, which I'm not very happy about. I thought I could at least get away with keeping these, but they obviously need to be replaced. So I'm gonna have to continue and basically remove the crank and take all the bearings out from the underside. And we're gonna be replacing an entire full set of them also. So I still have to remove the front mail, or sorry, that's the rear uh, main seal. And then the front one as well. And then we can get the crank out. So as you can see, the journals are in pretty good nick. There's no nowhere to speak of. The oil that came out of these caps with these bolts was absolutely jet black and st absolutely stinking. That's it there. Really, really sticky. Um, not great now to be honest with you basically as you pull the bolts out that's what actually comes out of the holes so and i did an oil change only like you know five miles ago so it just goes to show what stays in there but yeah the journals are in good nick at least um let's get this crank out and then we can examine the rest of the bearings A quick picture for reference. And that's the oil I was talking about. Absolutely jet black. And it stinks. Now this is where my inexperience comes in. I don't even know if they're stretch bolts. I presume they are. I presume they can't be reused. So I will work on that assumption, but I'll do a quick bit of research just to confirm it. God, it's so tight. And it's not the tightness of the bearing against the journal, it's actually the tightness of the cap inside the block itself. So that's number one, and they're actually labeled as well, so it goes one, two, three, and so on. And that's the condition of that bearing. Wow, quite a bit of wear on that one. That is not good. 
And interestingly, caps one through five, they're all labeled, but for some reason six and seven are not. These little uh, kind of standoffs, they're completely blank. So I'm after etching my own number into them. So that's number six and that's number seven, just so I can put them back in in the same order. Number three. And this one has a slightly different bearing. It's got these flanges on the outside. And yeah, it's actually quite a bit of wear on that one as well. Here's a quick look at the journals and they actually look really, really nice as you can see. A quick polish and they should come up very nicely. I've cleared a bit of space over here on my table, so I'm gonna lift out this crank. Jesus Christ, that's heavy. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh. I've just brought the main caps out of the daylight here just so we can have a better look at them. And yeah, there's quite a bit of wear on them. The top coating has been worn through, as you can see, on all six of them. And they definitely need to be replaced. Which is in contrast to the opposite side because as you can see, there's actually very little wear on these. They look really, really good. So I'm not sure if the best practice is to replace both sides. I'm sure it probably is. And have matching sides. Instead of having one side old and one side new. But they look really quite nice. So it's interesting that the opposite side has seen all the wear. And again, it's almost counter to what we saw on the actual uh, con rods on the pistons. Uh, again, one side definitely wears faster than the other. Yeah, they all look actually pretty decent. Yep, so unfortunately that caption is not a lie. I'm back in my house of all places. And as you can see, I'm after bringing my engine home. So I'm very lucky to have this room down the back of my house. It's unused, it's completely unfinished actually, as you can see. But it's got nice hard wearing floor slabs, so it doesn't matter if the place gets a little bit grubby or dirty. A little bit of a leak here in the top right. I need to get that sorted. But apart from that, it's the perfect space, perfect room for building an engine. And I just knew if I had to go away all the way out to that barn, in the cold, in the wind, in the rain, I just wouldn't be able to give this engine the attention that it needs. Everything needs to be done concisely and in a clean environment in terms of reassembly. And no better place to do that than in your own house. So why not? But I suppose the reason this has taken three months just to get to this point is parts availability. This engine is just an absolute nightmare now. So it's successor of the M73. There is still plenty of parts available for it as far as I know. I think it was made in greater numbers also. But the M70 has been just an absolute torture for the last two, three months. I just cannot get parts for it. And I find that as I'm ordering the parts, I feel like I'm the last person in the world to be ordering these parts because I'm trying to order from dealers all around the world. And they are literally becoming NLA, no longer available as I'm trying to order them. So I'll get like half a set of something and then good luck getting the rest. So I need to try and source them elsewhere. And that's specifically true of the main bearings. I've had to kind of mix and match uh, well, I suppose change my actual requirements in terms of, or expectations in terms of uh, what I think I can actually get my hands on. So I've had to kind of mix and match main bearings to get a full set. So we'll talk a whole lot more about that in depth. And I suppose around the two month mark or so, I noticed that the Gotze piston rings actually became available. So I know I said in the last video, I wasn't gonna to touch piston rings, but these suddenly became available. And I said, you know what, the whole engine's apart. These are actually available, which I couldn't believe. They're standard sizing, they're 0 0.00. So that introduces a whole new process, which I now need to sort in terms of sorting the cylinder bores. So I'm gonna do a whole bit on that. I noticed that rod bearings, they were available about two, three months ago, and then they became unavailable. So again, months went by until they actually became available again. So it's been an absolute fiasco. Uh, and to add to this fiasco, as you can see, this block has nice shiny decks which it shouldn't do because it's quite obviously been skimmed and I didn't want to get skimmed. So let me tell you a story about very, very bad service. Ah yes, so the story of the engine block. As I just mentioned, both of these decks are lovely and flat and skimmed. And the reason they're skimmed is because it's been to not one, but two different engine shops. And that's because engine shop one made an absolute balls of things. So I brought it to my local machine shop, engine shop, and the brief was, can you please clean the decks of all gasket material? Not a problem. 
I've got a few stuck bolts at the water pump end here. This is the front side of the engine. Can you remove them? And there's a water jacket at the back and there's one or two stuck bolts there too. Yeah, not a problem. And can you measure my crank while I'm here? Let's check for wear. Is it still within spec? Not an issue. So I left it in with them. Two, three weeks went by, no reply from them. So I just rang them, is it ready? Or it'll be ready tomorrow. So job was done. I collected the block and it was only when I got it home I had a close look at it. This is the state that I got the block back in. Both of the decks, not one, both of them were completely destroyed, as you can see, in really deep, heavy, aggressive scratching. The gentleman had essentially gone at both of the decks with a really coarse, aggressive sanding pad and just damaged the hell out of both of the perfectly otherwise flat decks. And I couldn't believe that this had actually come out of a machine shop. So I posted the photos online on the 8 Series Owners Group when I came home, just to ask the guys, is this normal? Maybe this will make a proper seal and straight away tens and tens of replies saying that's the worst work I've seen in 30, 40 years. Take it back to them, name and shame them, get them to refund your money, get them to fix it. Uh, so straight away, that's what I did. I went up to the guys. I'm not a confrontational guy. I didn't go in roaring and shouting. I said, you know what? I'm not happy with the service of these decks. I left it in to be cleaned and I got back a scratch block and instantly I was met with a tirade of abuse essentially saying, you're telling me how to do my job. This is how I always complete these decks. That's perfectly acceptable, that's perfectly flat. Um, and I was telling him that I'm not telling you how to do your job. I, I'm just not happy with the surface. I said online, I've seen many photos of these M70s when they're nice and clean uh, and basically ready to receive a head gasket. And he essentially said, well, take it to them then. And he just turned around and walked away from me. So it was at that point, I was done with him. I, I just knew he wasn't gonna help me out. Hi Mabel, what's up? Are you coming up? Oh. How are you? So I basically sat on him then for about two, three weeks and I was like, what am I gonna do here? I'll give them one more chance because at that point I left a negative Google review for them, a one star, and I sent them an email because I wanted a full record of basically what I was saying and what they were saying back to me. I said, guys, what can we do to fix these scratches? I'm the guy that left a one star review on your page. They essentially said, well, what would you like us to do? So they were asking me how to rectify the issue. So I said, as far as I'm aware, you could have sanded this out of flat. I don't know. I don't know how this, you're going to rectify this. So can we arrange for it to be skimmed? And they said, no, we will not skim it. All we'll do is polish it. So at that point, I just knew they were going to, with a drill attachment, just kind of sand or polish random areas of the deck. So I was like, that's not a, a reasonable uh, resolution. So I said, frig this, I'm done with you entirely. So I just took the entire block, drove down to Dublin, down to Ballymount, to Trident. Those guys, breath of fresh air. Stephen and Lorenzo, uh, they know their stuff inside out. I was chatting away with them. I said, guys, I've got a V12 in the back of the van. It's been destroyed by another engine block. Can you take a look? They said, yeah, no problem at all. They stuck it on their jig. They had it done in about six or seven days. And take a look at this photo because this was after the very first pass during the skimming process. And as you can see, the first machine shop had indeed sanded it completely out of flat. And up until that point, I was ready to pay that bill in its entirety out of my own pocket. But as soon as I saw that image, I thought, you know what? These guys are after scraping the hell out of this block. They're after sanding it out of flat. It could have blown a head gasket. I'm after running around for the last month here trying to get this sorted. I'm after up and down to Dublin. So I said, frig this, the first guys can pay for it. So I got onto them and I told them, here's the image of it being sanded completely out of flat. You guys did this. You can pay me directly. You can pay the guys in Trident or I can take this further. So fairness to them, in two or three days, they paid the bill in its entirety. I came down and I collected the block and it was all done and dusted. So you guys may disagree with it, but I removed the Google review entirely because in fairness, they sorted it. Still horrible work, I'll never go back, I'll never recommend them, but I removed the review because they paid the bill and they fixed it in the end. And you know what, it's all water under the bridge. I have clean decks now. I will have to look into what I have to do with the head gas because basically the, the block is slightly shorter now, so I'm gonna to have to compensate for that. And the same with uh, the timing cover as well. So, but I've got nice clean flat decks ready to receive uh, two heads, so let's talk about these Alusil bores. So this is where things get a little bit interesting. As I mentioned at the top of the video, I'm gonna replace the entire set of piston rings 
And I know I said in previous videos, I'm not gonna do that. Compression's absolutely fine. There's no reason to do it. And there's a very valid argument for that. But I'm very conscious of the fact there's 133,000 miles on these pistons and these rings. There's gonna be a level of wear there. There's no doubt about it. And these are very hard to get and they came available. So I snapped them up and it makes sense. I've got the engine apart to this level. It just doesn't make sense to reassemble it without replacing piston rings as long as the proper procedure is followed. But the thing is, you can't just slap in a whole new set of piston rings on an Alucil block. So what is an Alucil block? So as it sounds, Alucil, aluminium silicon, it's an alloy. So it's about roughly 70-30. So it's 30% silicon and 70% aluminium. That can vary, 20-80. Uh, so this could be somewhere in the middle. I'm not too sure, 25-75 um, kind of ratio. So the entire block is that alloy. So we don't have bore liners or anything like that. Essentially what's inside this block is the same surface that we have inside these bores. But there's a very special mechanical uh, and chemical procedure that is applied to these bores when these blocks are essentially manufactured that makes them incredibly hard wearing and produces this dull finish. If you can imagine it was a pure aluminium block, they'd be worn through in no time at all considering the amount of uh, travel and the amount of work that the pistons do over the lifetime of the block. These bores would be worn down to nothing in no time at all. So thankfully there's actually lots of really good information online about Alucil, how the blocks are formed, what their makeup is, it's really quite fascinating stuff. I have a document here from Colbert Schmidt and they're one of the, I wouldn't say the pioneers of Alucil because I think it goes back a lot earlier than that, right back to the 30s. But over the last 40, 50 years, they've essentially refined the modern process for Alucil and it remains a trademark of theirs. But if you can imagine essentially what happens at the final stage of manufacturing of these Alucil blocks, you've basically got the raw cylinder liners, sorry, not the liners, but the inside of the cylinder walls. They essentially need to be honed and rubbed back essentially to expose the silicon crystals. And you're left with these little silicon islands protruding through the aluminium. And you can see it here on this document at a microscopic level. These light gray spots are our silicon crystals, or our silicon islands, and they're essentially floating, well, they're impregnated, obviously, in this light gray surface, which is our cylinder wall. This is all aluminum, but they're brought to the forefront after the honing process. So that's the final finishing stage, whereby these are left proud of the aluminum, and it's upon this surface that the actual piston rings ride. Now, there's obviously a layer of oil that surrounds these crystals and runs across the face of the crystals, and it's essentially on the oil on which the rings run, but it's this really hard silicon crystal that the rings, if they do contact the cylinder bores, it's the silicon crystals that they're engaging with and not the aluminum wall, the much softer material. And what you're essentially left with over time is intercrystal deposits. So you get essentially piston ring material, you get carbon material, basically building up around these crystals. And this surface needs to be cleaned as the first step of bedding in. Well, to get our rings to bed in correctly, we need to wear this away and get this factory finish back once more. And the way that we do that is in a two-stage process. The first step of that process is to use Scotch-Brite. And what we're essentially gonna be doing is wearing back some of the aluminum as the first stage, and then we're gonna be polishing with felt pads and a special paste. So let's get started on this first step. So let's take another look at our cylinder blocks. So up close, even here at the camera, you can see that these cylinder bores have a bit of a mirror shine to them. There's a like, gloss finish, which is indication after 130,000 miles, as you might expect, of a well bedded in engine. So the pistons and piston rings that were came out of the engine are well bedded in against this surface, but it is not the surface that we want for our new piston rings. So what we want to achieve is very much the opposite of this gloss finish we want a nice dulled finish because that dull finish is indication of a, a worn down aluminium wall and newly exposed silicon crystals so that's what we want to achieve so we're not changing the ovality of uh, any of these bores we're not going to be changing the inner dimensions anything beyond an absolutely microscopic level so the idea as i mentioned is to wear down this alum aluminium wall ever so slightly get those crystals exposed and the first step of that is to use Scotch-Brite. Now we're going to be using the absolute finest Scotch-Brite pad along with some oil and the objective on the first step is to remove any of those intercrystal deposits that I mentioned earlier on 
So we're going to be removing piston ring deposits, we're going to be removing carbon and we want to get rid of that first before we move on to the second step which is essentially uh, a very light honing or lapping of these cylinder walls and that's going to be the final step of bedding in the new piston rings so let's move on to that first step and I thought I might mention actually as well that some guys on the Porsche forums especially I've seen one or two guys they've essentially just slapped in new piston rings and they haven't had any real issues so I'm not going to say that you can you can't really do this wrong you can absolutely do this wrong but it just goes to show that even with Alucil it's, it's a very hard um, somewhat forgiving surface obviously if you ran a stone into one of these or if you scrape them in some ways you're going to be in real trouble but essentially even if you just popped in new piston rings they're the correct size chances are you might see ever so slight increased amount of smoke or oil consumption but you're not going to do damage to the engine essentially these are very hard wearing walls it's a fascinating technology but let's move on to the first step we're going to do this right we're going to make sure there's no oil consumption it's going to be no smoking these rings are going to bed in nicely, so let's move on to the first step. Just before we get started, I'm after masking off this deck in its entirety. All holes and channels have been completely covered. It makes sense. We don't want any of this oil or aluminium mix going down inside the block and making cleaning later on that bit more difficult. So I've already done five of these cylinders and I've left this one. Yes, this one still to do and I'll show you the whole procedure. So what I'm using is a standard three prong stone hone. The stones are still in here, they're underneath these green scotch bright pads, but as you can see they're completely covered, so God forbid these zip ties actually failed and one of the pads went flying off. I've actually covered the stones in a few layers of uh, duct tape, which is what guys online have done, it's a great idea. And as you can see I just drilled a small hole in each pad and each one is quite securely attached. As I said I've done five of these already and there's no sign of this failing at all, it's nice and sturdy. So essentially what my procedure is, is uh, basically to clean off the cylinder in its entirety we don't want any grit or sand or you know little bits uh, sticking to the cylinder wall so the cylinder wall is squeaky clean then we lubricate the entire cylinder wall with standard weight oil i'm just using 10w40 which is the engine oil for this engine and then i'm liberally applying the same oil straight onto these pads so these are soaked in the same oil and i grab my handheld drill and we're running for about 120 rpm for about 40 seconds in total so my procedure is to do 20 seconds first and then follow up with another 20 seconds. So after the first 20 seconds, I just remove the hole entirely. I reapply lubrication to all the pads, make sure all the pads aren't coming loose and then do the final 20 seconds. So it's 40 seconds in total for at 120 RPM. Now this comes back to the discussion once again is, is this step necessary? It is officially, this is a step in the Alucil process. So it does need to be done. But some engine builders I was talking to essentially said, just do this step by hand. You don't need to use the drill attachment. Just scuff up the cylinder walls by hand, you know, spend about a minute on each one, and that's good enough. And now there's other guys that have do a lot more than 40 seconds with the three-pronged hone. So I'm landing somewhere in the middle. I'm just gonna do the 40 seconds. As I say, 20 seconds, 20 seconds. And you'll see the color of the oil change. We are removing aluminium, but it's an absolute minuscule amount. Uh, Guys online have measured these cylinders after doing this process and the difference is as small as 0 0.001 of a millimeter so the difference is indiscernible but it's absolutely necessary in terms of making a good ring seal. So let's run through the process and we'll do this last cylinder on this deck side. And then we introduce our hone and we're going to lubricate these pads liberally. And these pads are actually already pretty saturated in oil, but there's no harm in applying more. And we're aiming for 120 revolutions per minute. That's about two revolutions per second. And I'm going to do my first 20 seconds. So that's my first 20 seconds. Check my pads. 
everything's rock solid. I'm going to re-lubricate my pads again. And do our final 20 seconds. All right, and that's it. We want to clean off our cylinder and cylinder area. And as you can see, we are removing some aluminium. We've got a dark gray color there. All right, that's the last one done. Okay, so let's move on to the final stage. You're gonna need two pieces of equipment. So in my case, I'm using the same three-pronged hone. And what I've done is I've removed the Scotch-Brite pads entirely and I've replaced them with these felt pads. And these felt pads, they're nothing special. They are essentially self-adhesive pads that are commonly used on the underside of furniture feet. So the underside of your sofa, you can pick these up for like $2 or two euro in most stores. I cut them to size. Like I say, they're self-adhesive. I just degrease the duct tape sections basically and they stick on really, really hard. Now it should be noted, I've already done this cylinder here and it's come up absolutely perfect. So that's why these felt pads uh, look like they're uh, already a bit used because they are. Um, and then the other item that you're going to need, as mentioned, is some kind of a lapping compound. Now, this is a topic in itself. So essentially, what's commonly used on all the US forms, um, on the Porsche forms, BMW forms, is Sonnen's product, which is the Sonnen AN30 lapping compound, which you cannot get in Europe for love nor money. I essentially tried to order this, get it shipped to Europe but the guys refunded my money because they have a special agreement, exclusive agreement with Sunnen for North America, and they will not ship the products if they've any inkling that it's gonna be shipped to Europe. So they canceled my order, which left me kind of stuck. So I did a bit of research on it, and what I've gone with is, and even this is incredibly hard to find, this is a pound of aluminum oxide lapping compound from the American Lap Company. Um, this has an unusual grain structure, uh, and basically a regular grain size and it's used for light to moderate levels of lapping so it's the least aggressive product the American Lap Company have. They've got like four or five other lapping compounds and they all get increasingly more aggressive and like you say this is the least aggressive and I've done the cylinder already and I've got fantastic results and uh, so my method basically is instead of rubbing the oil on the inside like on the first step Again, I'm making sure my cylinder is completely degreased. I apply my lapping compound again liberally on the inside. I apply a small bit to the actual felt pads. And then I've noticed, as a lot of people say the same thing, is to apply a small bit of oil as well, which kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, what's the word? Uh, dilutes the solution as such. Um, so, and also makes the pads uh, float over the surface a bit better as well. So I found that I'm going at a much lower RPM this time because I'm not entirely confident about these pads. Now I've done the cylinder in its entirety. I've basically spent about 120 seconds, so two minutes in total on the cylinder. Uh, taking a few kind of regular breaks just to make sure everything's still attached. And it's come up absolutely perfect. So I'll show you what it looks like now.
As mentioned, I've done the very last cylinder on this side. The first five, however, have not progressed beyond the very first stage. So you can see here with the fifth cylinder wall, still very much scratched up. You can see all the cross hatching still very apparent. And then we move on to the very last cylinder, which has been completed with the aluminum oxide. And my goodness, what a difference. That's the kind of level and finish we're trying to achieve. Nice and dull and flat, uh, nicely polished, uh, but not glossy. It's completely dulled and flat which looks top class. This is basically what the cylinder would have looked like when it was new. And that's the kind of level that we're trying to achieve. So let's move on to the other 12 and we'll get this lot done in one go. Let's go for 30 seconds. Just gonna check over my pads. Now I did notice that the pads tend to rub on the outside edge as opposed to the face of the pad, but it does appear to be producing consistent results. And this pad, for example, it looks like it's rubbing nearly across the entire face of the pad. So I think that as the pads bed in, you would see more running uh, across the entire face of the pad. Another 30 seconds. Check the pads once more. The adhesive seems to be holding up. Just gonna apply a little bit more oil. Another 30 seconds. Trying to rub down the cylinder and see what kind of results we've produced. So after that quick process, there were still a few very fine scratches on the cylinder wall. So I just went at another 30 seconds or so just off camera. And as you can see, we now have the same flat, dull, finish as we do with cylinder one. So came out very, very nicely. There's the third cylinder still with its cross hatching, uh, ready to have the same process applied. So on the last 30 seconds or so I just did, I actually just used the compound by itself. I didn't use any more oil. What I'm finding is the more oil that is applied, the cutting effectiveness is dropping quite drastically. Um, maybe with the Sun and AN30, more oil is more effective with that particular compound. What I'm finding with the uh, aluminum oxide at least is just the paste by itself with a very small bit of oil does the job nicely. So we're going to apply the same kind of process to all the other cylinders in and around, I would say 90 seconds to 120 seconds per cylinder is giving me the results that I'm getting here at the moment. I'm stopping every 30 seconds or so just to check on my pads and yeah, it's getting great results. So I'm going to keep going with that process and hopefully we'll have the other 10 done in no time at all.
Da, 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 da. Cylinder number 12. Finito! What's interesting, if you actually rub the inside of the cylinder bore like this in a clockwise and counterclockwise direction, you actually expose quite a bit of the cross hatching. But if you rub vertically up and down, it very much dulls the finish and you see less cross hatching. It's probably not uh, that apparent on camera, but it's quite apparent in person. And I believe that's because there's still residue in the actual cylinder bore, so it's important to get these squeaky clean. And then I think it shouldn't make a difference whether it's rubbed up and down or side to side. Right, now that we have the engine block nice and clean, I'm going to turn my focus to the actual crankshaft itself. So all these oil passageways need to be cleaned out. Essentially all the rod journals here are connected directly to the main bearing journals in terms of the oil passageways. So if I stick my brush up through this main journal here, it pops out here on this rod bearing journal. So I'm just going to clean it all out with brake cleaner and do it nice and gently. Okay, so the room is a little bit more presentable. I've done a bit of cleaning, a bit of degreasing. There was a lot of oil and grease about, but now it's time to talk about main bearings. As I mentioned at the top of the video, the main bearings for the M70 are an absolute nightmare now to try and source. Essentially, like all modern BMW bearings, they're available in a multitude of different colors and the colors dictate the size. 
and then the color that you're picking is dictated by the size of your journals, the amount of wear on it. So the M70 cranks, these are of course 75 mil main bearings. So they're all 75 mil. And I'll just show you here the official workshop manual for the M70 engine. This section here in red, as you can see, this is the ground size of main bearing journals. And we have three different sizes. We've got yellow, green, and white. And with each color, we've got a corresponding size. So they're all slightly undersized uh, compared to the actual size of, of the actual journal, uh, which is 75 mil officially. But as you can see, we have the three varying sizes. So what I did was I have my micrometer. So I've, I've measured my crank multiple times. I did it over the last few months, but I have my micrometer set to, um, it's set to 74.96 of a millimeter. So as you can see, the smallest size here is the white one, which is 0.971. So I've got my micrometer set to 0.96, which is slightly smaller than that. And due to, I suppose, the level of wear, which is absolutely microscopic. Um, that is the size of my main bearing. So it, this just about slips over, as you can see. And all of these journals are very uniform. I've measured them. I spent a lot more time on it uh, than what I'm doing right now. But just to show you, that's the general size that I was getting. So I decided on the standard white bearings. That's absolutely fine. We have a radial crankshaft bearing play range as you can see so this is basically the gap the allowable gap or allowable space between the actual journal and the bearing itself and as you can see it's very precise it's 0.026 to 0.052 of a millimeter so that's the amount of space that you're allowed between the bearing and the crank so i opted for the white bearings great so i started ordering them up and of course all my orders are coming back this part's not available not available it may be put into, put into production and of course months went by and they never went into production and they just went NLA and that was the end of it. So lots of conflicting information, parts available, uh, lots of refunds. But I wanted, what I ended up was, was essentially, so these are all the top bearings, the groove ones. These are all white, brilliant, happy days. I managed to source another white one and another white one for, so these are the bottom caps. So the bottom ones are the ones that take uh, all the hardship essentially as you can see they're all marked on the side that's what dictates that it's or shows that it's actually a white bearing but this is really old stock as you can see look at that 0293 so it's very old stock but that's all i could source for the bottom two whites and that's it so i was like what on earth am i gonna do so let me at least measure everything so i got my plastic gauge out and these are the results that I got. So what I did was I made a list of every single journal, one through seven, as you can see. I got all of my tops. So my tops were all installed into the actual crankcase. I put my crank in and I put all my caps on. And what I did was, because I didn't have the correct amount of tops, I used the same white one all the way across. And I measured every single one of them individually with the same white bearing. So I had all whites on the bottom and one white top. So I just wanted to get an idea of my uh, plastic gauge readings. And these are the readings that I got. So remember, we have 0 0.026 to 0 0.052. And these are all well within spec. So just ignore this one. I measured it twice after this. So journal one, I actually got 0 0.036 roughly, 0 0.37, 0 0.037. And then all the rest of them are very consistent, uh, all well within spec. So then I asked myself, what on earth am I going to do for the missing ones? So at that point, I decided, let's order in one yellow one and do the exact same thing. So I put all my whites in again and I measured using yellows. And as you can see, these are the differences between the whites and the yellows with just a yellow on one side and white on the other side. And as you can see, they are also perfectly well in spec. It's probably at this point you're thinking, what on earth is he doing? You can't go mixing sizes of bearings. You can't have one size on one side and one size on the other and expect things to work well. What about excess wear? What about the actual ovality of the bearing shape that you're creating? That can't work. You're not doing things correctly. Well, it turns out you can absolutely do this and it's being done very frequently and very often by engine builders all the time, especially in racing circles. It's very common to pick and choose the bearing sizes that you require to get the desired clearance clearances that you're trying to achieve. So it's absolutely very common. All that being said, I would obviously prefer 
and I think most people would prefer to have all your bearings at the correct color, have them uniform across the entire board, tops and bottoms. But the reality is you cannot rebuild an M70 engine anymore without mixing and matching your bearings because these are not available from anyone. Nobody makes these. You can't go to ACL or King and say, just give me some M70 bearings. They don't have them. They do not produce them. There is the option of going down the route of getting your bearings coated. That's a very valuable option. A lot of these modern coatings are phenomenal. I just didn't like the idea of coating some of these very heavily worn bearings. It just didn't sit right with me, so I didn't go down that road. I wanted and I preferred to have brand new bearings from BMW. Now, instead of just asking this question randomly on the internet and just asking guys, what do you think? Is this acceptable? The reality is you'll get a million answers from guys that have never built engines. I wanted to get answers from guys who built engines all day long. And so that's what I did. I asked several engine builders, um, is this acceptable? I explained what I was doing, the situation with the bearings. Uh, I showed them my measurements and everyone that I asked said, yes, that's absolutely fine. You can do that. There's no problem doing that at all. The differences between the bearings that we're talking about is so negligible. It's just a tiny, tiny difference. I even asked, and I have his email open here, Henry Lawrence over in Power Plant Racing in the USA. From what I can make out, he spent half a lifetime essentially building M70s um, and just getting crazy horsepower out of them from a racing standpoint. And as he said himself, the difference in bearing thickness is negligible. The hydrodynamic dynamic pressure wave of the oil will locate uh, the crank relative to the bearings. So it's not going to cause any kind of excess wear. The, essentially the crank itself centers itself within the bearings and the wave of pressure that the oil produces essentially keeps everything centered. Everything does change shape on an absolute microscopic level and everything essentially self-centers to an extent. And the differences again that we're talking about are so minute, it's not gonna be an issue. I would not be happy doing this if I thought this was going to be a problem, but like I mentioned, the reality is you cannot rebuild an M70 without doing what I'm doing. It's just not possible anymore. Now, I'm actually a little bit surprised to see the amount of wear on these main bearings because it's commonly said online that the M70 is rock solid. There's a fair chance we had some oiling issues here maybe. Um, I'm not quite sure. Maybe uh, service intervals were way too, you know, the difference there in time was far too long. Uh, maybe the wrong, wrong grade of oil was being used. Who knows what the reason was, but we've quite a, a large amount of wear there. But this is maybe somewhat of an unusual situation having to replace the bearings. But you know what? I'm just gonna do it, the engine's apart, so it's time to do it. So what I'm gonna do next is, I'm blabbing on here, I'm going to get all my bearings installed, I'm gonna get all my yellows and my whites, I'm gonna spread them evenly, and I'm gonna do a dry fit inside the actual crankcase. So I'm gonna get all my bearings in, get the crank in, uh, torque everything down, and I'm gonna plastic gauge my final setup. And once I'm happy with that, once I've got the clearances that I require, boom, we're gonna start reassembling the entire engine. So let's get started. Okay, so we have all seven saddles here for taking the main bearings. There's still a bit of staining on them, but they are squeaky clean. I've just degreased them for a third time and there's no getting these stains off, but they're absolutely fine otherwise. So let's get started with the bearings. So these are groove bearings. We've got three oil holes on them as well and they have locating notches, which makes it very easy to locate them in the actual saddle. So I'm just going to insert them here one at a time. Basically just make sure they're flush on both sides. That's seated nicely. There is one or two marks on the face of these, but they are brand new and they're just basically the way they are. There's one or two additional marks from me um, doing my plastic aging uh, a few weeks ago. But aside from that, they are essentially brand new on the face. Now we're just gonna keep going with all these main bearings. And lastly we have the guide bearing. This is a much bigger, chunkier bearing as you can see. And this prevents the lateral movement of the actual crank or the front to back movement of it. So it's also notched and it goes in just like the other bearings. And that's nice and flush. Okay, here she comes. I forgot how heavy this thing is. So what I like to do is just make sure the front and the rear are lined up pretty symmetrically. So there's the same amount of gap at the front and the back. 
and then just give it a light spin as it goes in and that's it seated okay so that's spinning fairly freely just make sure all my bearings are still nice and flush which they are and now we can look at our top caps I nearly forgot I obviously have to put my plastic gauge down before I reinstall the caps and the bearings so let's do that now I'm just going to lay it on every single one of the large journals because I I am one of the creatures of the night there we go I'm just laying out my caps in the order in which they're going to be installed that's seven through one and I've got my guide bearing has to go on number seven and then I'm trying to decide what color bearings to put where I've decided upon putting the two whites on journal uh, five and six and it should bring this slightly uh, higher clearance of 44 and 45 back down to 40 and 40 and then I'm going to put the yellows on the remaining four I think it's the most balanced option but again depending on the actual plastic gauge readings we can readjust if required so I'm going to pop open the yellows here and lay them all out Everything is nicely degreased so I can now set about installing my bearings and again it's much the same process just make sure everything winds up nice and flat on both sides. Sweet! Okay, so there is an orientation to the actual caps, the number marking here, as you're standing at the back of the engine looking up towards the front, you should be able to read them the correct way up. So if you have the number on the left side, and you have to be on this side of it to read it, you have it the wrong way around. So it should be just like this. And I'm going to insert the cap nice and gently, just so it rests in place. And it's not located down in its actual seat. Uh, the bolts themselves will do that for me. So that's number seven. We're going to work our way up to number one. Just being careful not to disrupt the plastic gauge. So no knocks and no bangs. Just nice and gentle. Yeah, so let's talk bolts for a second. I do have a brand new set of bolts here from BMW. We've got all 14 of them. They are 17 mil Tortiel single use stretch bolts. And we will not be using them at this stage because these are 150 euro. So they're 10 euro a bolt. Again, no aftermarket options. So you have to go with the BMW ones, but it's more than sufficient at this stage to just use the original bolts which I've cleaned up and I was already using these for my previous clearances and they're more than sufficient for getting the caps torqued down and just to get a clearance reading it's more than acceptable to use these so I'm going to pop them into each cap and we're going to torque them down to the correct spec and we're going to use our angle torque wrench as well and then we're going to pull all the caps and get our readings then
Okay, so just before we torque everything down, I just want to mention these outer support sleeves. I don't have any bolts installed in them, and before you install your caps, you should make sure that those uh, support sleeves are wound all the way up inside the cap, so they aren't touching the block, otherwise they're going to interfere with these bolts and then the torque values. So just ignore them for this step. What we're doing here is just getting the clearance again for the actual bearing itself, and we don't need these support sleeves installed yet. They're part of the final step. So I'm going to start by torquing these down from the middle, and outwards and it's 20 newton meters and we're going to be aiming for 70 degrees on my dial gauge which is here. Let's make sure the whole block doesn't spin. Seventy. Just a few minutes later, I'm going to start taking the caps off again. Oh, need to bring my impact next time. Last one. How do things look? I just whipped out my actual plastic gauge and I've done all of my measurements and I've made a note of them here in my notepad. If you recall, we have our three different readings now. So the original ones were with the whites on one side and whites on the other. This is whites on one side and then the yellows on the other. And now these are my new measurements with the four yellows, the two whites, and the guide is actually a green, which I actually failed to mention. Green was available in this, which is a good thing, because that means it's closer to the original white in terms of dimension. Now, the strange thing is, these values, if you think about it, these yellows should be exactly the same as these yellows, because there's no difference. Um, I put that difference down to the slight inaccuracy in terms of actually reading the gauge, so I'll show you why in a moment. And also, when I was torquing these ones down, I didn't actually have my angle wrench at the time. I was only torquing to about 45 degrees. Supposedly it makes no difference if you go to full torque or not in terms of the actual reading. I was reading that it has very little effect, but that may also play into it. So just to show you on the first one here, so we've got, uh, this is journal number one, 0 0.038 is the note that I've made. If I hold up, and sorry, just to show you as well, that was the original clearance for ring for 0.026 to 0 0.052, which handily enough on this gauge nearly matches the M7 exactly, 0 0.025. Uh, to 0 0.050 so it should be landing somewhere in between these three sizes and the first bit of squash plastic gauge here as you can see if I just hold it up to the smaller size nowhere near that so we just move it on to the next one which is the 0 0.038 and as you can see it matches absolutely perfectly at the thickest section of the actual squash piece so that is 0 0.038 and that's the note that I made there next three ones are 0 0.040 now uh, this is where the slight inaccuracy can come in because it's ever so slight, it's, it's down to interpretation essentially what this figure is. As you can see the squash piece there is ever so slightly smaller than the 0 0.038 which means it's closer to the 0 0.050 reading and again it's open to interpretation as to what that figure is. I am essentially guessing but again it's just to give you a guide because it's slightly off the 0 0.038 it's much closer to the 0 0.040 that's essentially what I've put down. These uh, next few journals are ex essentially exactly the same. 
again it's to give you basically a rough guide as opposed to an exact figure and then we are on to both of our whites both of our whites generate slightly less clearance as you expect 0 0.037 and again as you can see that squash piece of plastic gauge is uh, quite a bit bigger than that which means it's closer to the 0 0.025 and then measuring the last one which is the guide one here blobs ever so slightly smaller again so that's in around 0 0.040 which is what I've measured here. So I'm actually very happy with those clearances. They're pretty much slap bang in the middle of the allowable clearance. They're all very close to each other. There's very little variance. The max variance we have is pretty much 0.4 to 0.37. So excellent results. I'm, I'm happy with that. So I'm going to clean off all the plastic gauge and get ready for this final fit. I'm just doing one final check of all the passageways, making sure they're all free of any kind of dirt or grit or swarf, God forbid, and especially any dead end bolt holes like this one and this one. We don't want anything at the bottom, which will prevent the bolts from torquing down fully. I'm happy with that. For the lubrication of the big bearings, I'm going to be using Liquid Molly's assembly lube. And we're just going to apply it to each of the bearings. This lube is designed to mix with engine oil, so after one or two oil changes, you won't find any trace of it. And when you get to the end with the truss or the guide bearing, you want to make sure you lubricate the sides as well as the face of the bearing. Nice. I've given the crank one last clean and it's time to pop it in. There we go. Nice and smooth. I'm going to loosely position all my caps in place and then I'm going to start screwing down the bolts. Again, because this is the guide bearing, we need some lube on the sides. And remembering our orientation, we want to have the number on the right side as you're locking up the block. I'm actually going to follow Uncle Tony, who's an engine builder on YouTube. I'm going to follow his technique for bottom end building, which is basically putting each cap in one at a time. So you're not doing all seven. You're installing one cap, you're inserting your bolts, you're putting them hand tight. And basically then you're going to rotate the crank and make sure it's a perfect fit. There's no interference, so there's no problems with the crank rotating. Then you move on to the next cap and so on until you've got all seven installed. And at that point, I'm going to start torquing them down. But I want to do a revolution every single time I install the cap just to make sure everything's good and there's nothing binding up. Because it's incredibly difficult to get the full workshop manual for the M70, it's not entirely clear whether these should be lubricated or not. I think the general rule is you want a very small amount of lubrication on your bolts. So I'm going to put a very small amount on here, wipe off the excess and just have a very small amount of lubrication on them. They seem quite dirty out of the pack and that could well have been lubrication at some point. But any excess we certainly don't want them dripping and I think that's an absolutely fine amount. We just don't want them going in bone dry. Because this is the guide bearing, I'm gonna leave it just as it is for now. It's not fully closed down. I've got about a two mil gap at the bottom here. So it's still actually quite loose. 
I'm going to explain why in a moment. I'm going to install the rest of my caps and then come back to this one. And that's the last one. And that's nice and smooth. So that is everything buttoned up nicely and that brings me back to the truss bearing cap which we need to make a slight adjustment on. So this is an M70 specific. I think we could probably skip this step to be honest with you but I've seen it done on a few engine building videos so it probably just makes sense to do it. Essentially, all of these caps, they're being centered and aligned by the bolts themselves. So here's one of the old bolts. You have this widening here at the top just before the bolt head and the chamfering here. And as you put it down into the cap and it naturally goes into the actual bolt hole on the crankcase itself, essentially self-centers. But you can have, obviously there's no lateral movement because it's almost like a press fit left to right. There's no movement there at all. But essentially when it comes to the truss bearing, it can be ever so slightly positioned to the rear or to the front at a microscopic level. So the top bearing isn't necessarily properly aligned with the lower bearing. So what we can do, because we've got the flanges that come up from these bearings, because these bearings are different from all the other bearings, and they're essentially almost, they are contacting the actual uh, counterweight on the crankshaft itself. We can give the crankshaft itself a whack forwards, give it a whack backwards, and that then aligns this cap perfectly with the crankcase itself and keeps those bearings perfectly aligned. So obviously we need to do the step before we torque everything down. So I'm going to do that now. Give it a hit this way, give it a hit that way, and then we can button everything down with the correct torque values. So let's give it a go. So I've seen this done with steel hammers. I'm sure they're absolutely fine. I'm just going to use this rubber mallet with the ball bearings on the inside. So we're going to need to rotate the crank. So our weight is slightly protruding here, so I don't end up whacking one of the caps. So I'm going to give it a hit this way. And you give it quite a hard whack. And then give it a whack backwards. And that's it, I'm happy with that. Our torque wrench is on 20 still, 20 newton meters, and I'm going to work from the back towards the front. And mark all my bolts and all these lines should end up facing the same direction once I angle them down. Seventy. And the last one. Sweet. And that spins nicely. We obviously have a lot of caps here and bearings pushing down on the crank. So it's not super easy to turn it. But it's also a big 25 kilo crankshaft. And there's a bit of resistance obviously with the compression of the caps so but it's moving freely no issues so now that we have all of our bolts torqued to spec we can focus on these little fellas these little hat shaped objects they are threaded support sleeves and they're located in each of the caps and they essentially make the entire bottom end far more rigid than it would be otherwise it's a very clever design 
but essentially they need to get wound down until they meet the crankcase they're kind of floating there as you can see and once they meet the crankcase they get they get torqued to 10 newton meters they have a little uh, allen insert as you can see and then the actual bolt and the washer goes through it that also needs to get torqued to spec and also needs to be angled also but the problem with the bolts are they are no longer available so I have to reuse the original ones which is a real shame three of them are standoffs but the rest of them are just regular uh, stretch bolts thing is you can absolutely reuse these basically everyone that re re rebuilds these engines they reuse the same bolts and uh, they're far less critical obviously than the main bolts you absolutely have to replace these but these are here essentially for additional rigidity additional insurance essentially but once they get torqued to spec and uh, this should be absolutely fine there's no issue with them coming out or anything like that so uh, let's get started on winding these down and we'll get them torqued to spec as well i have my torx bit here i'm just going to start running these down Ten newton meters. Okay, so let's talk M70 pistons. So I actually have all eleven of my pistons here cleaned and ready to roll. They've been re-ringed, so I know my way around these pistons well at this stage. They are a lightweight piston by design, so the entire head is aluminium, and we've got a one tenth mil iron coating applied to them for durability. That's for riding up and down inside the alley sill bores. We have a forged connecting rod. Uh, these caps. It's important not to mix these up with the other pistons. Keep them with each connecting rod. It's very obvious if you install these the wrong way around, as you can see, they've kind of got a step here which absolutely should not be there, so it looks very wrong. And when it's installed correctly, you actually have two laser engraved numbers lining up like this, and everything's nice and straight. So what I've noticed is all these wrist pins tend to be very gummy. This one isn't actually too bad, but some of them were terrible. It just the piston was the head was not moving freely on the rod at all. So it's important that we degrease and clean all this up. I want to clean all these skirts up. I want to remove the piston rings, clean all the recesses, clean the oiling holes that pass from the outside to the inside. In general, the rings haven't been too bad in terms of condition, uh, but there is chamfers and bevels in these actual piston rings, and they are full of carbon, as are the actual recesses themselves. The top ring is a chrome lined ring, it's actually a very tough ring. The middle ring is a little uh, softer in terms of uh, flexibility. Uh, that's compression ring number two and then the third ring is the oil scraper ring which is a two-part design which basically has a rubber lined ring uh, or spring essentially on the inside of it so it's actually a two-part two-piece design uh, the actual head as you can see in the crown we've got this kind of offset uh, compression well uh, it's basically oriented in the direction of the spark plug so you actually find that the six pistons on the left side actually don't match the six pistons on the right so again there is a specific orientation and it's important that they aren't mixed up so like i say i want to get new rings installed so the first step is to clean this whole thing up and then we can move on to installing the rings and i'll also talk about ring gap so let's get started so i bought a cheapo spring compressor kit on amazon and it came with this ring remover which is literally as cheap as it gets but you know what it actually works pretty well so i can just pop it on the top ring here and it comes off pretty damn easy as you can see and then I just repeat the process for the middle ring and then this compression ring essentially what I do is I get the ring off the actual rubber line spring itself and we're doing our best not to scrape the side of the piston this comes off very easily and here we can see the intersection of this ring so this is actually kind of like a spring over a wire. So you can actually separate it ever so slightly and just lift it off entirely. So that, if you can see, is essentially what it looks like. It almost looks like a necklace. So, and you can actually slide that back together again. So that makes installation much, much easier. 
here you can actually see how dirty these grooves are so the very top one is actually shiny clean as you can see but then they just get very very dirty the second one there is actually not too bad but then this bottom one is absolutely terrible really really dirty so we need to scrape all that out obviously without damaging the piston i'm just using a combination of brake cleaner and some uh, medium coarseness in terms of brush and it comes off pretty easy Great, I think I'm happy with that. So this is always a fun topic to discuss, piston rings. So as you can see, I have gone for Getz piston rings. These are the characteristic yellow boxes, which are synonymous with Getz. I basically installed them on all my pistons here, just at a shot to the right. And the last one I have to do is this one, which is piston number six. So the reason I've gone with Getz piston rings is cost. Um, now I like to think that this is a no expense spirit project but the reality is Getz piston rings these were about 380 euro I think for 12 sets of them the OEM ones are 1100 euro for an OEM set so Getz is remarkably cheaper um, or very notably cheaper and the quality is still there they're top brand so just to talk about these dimensions um, essentially we've got them stamped here on the box so the first dimension here, the 84mm, that is the actual piston head itself. And then the three subsequent dimensions, 1.75mm, 1.75mm and 3mm, that's the actual height of the piston rings, so compression ring 1, 2 and 3 is the actual height of the ring itself. So as you can see it's standard sizing, it doesn't deviate in any way from the original factory rings in terms of any dimension essentially. But it does differ in terms of the ring gap or the end ring clearance. And to those of you not initiated, essentially ring gap is essentially the gap that remains between the two tips here when the ring is actually inserted and compressed inside the cylinder itself. And you can measure your ring gap because ring gap is quite important uh, with a regular profile gauge like this. Now there is an allowable range with all engines and the allowable range on the M70 is written here at the top. So 0.15 of a millimeter to 0.35 of a millimeter. And as you can see, I've made all my measurements. I essentially got a ring and then you install it into each cylinder and then you measure your ring gap with your profile gauge like I just mentioned. As you can see, this is ring one and then there's ring two, even though I have it A and B. I didn't bother doing C because I just wanted to get a rough idea for ring one and two and ring uh, three, the oil scraper ring is less critical in terms of end gap clearance. But I just wanted to get a general idea like I say and as you can see, these dimensions are quite a bit larger. They're quite a bit outside the allowable range for the brand new factory rings. 0.63 to 0.65 on ring one, and then ring two, 0.7 to 0.65 pretty much, but it's 0.7 pretty much across the board. They're very consistent results, but they're consistently outside these ranges, which is a characteristic of Getz piston rings. Now if you read online, again, a lot of the Porsche forums have the exact same thing because these are very popular with the Porsche guys and they all see the same thing. That, I don't know if, if you can call them undersized or oversized, I suppose they're slightly undersized because the ring gap is larger, but they are consistently undersized in terms of the ring gap compared to the OEM rings. Now, out of curiosity, I got some of my old rings and did some measurements. Now I only did it on every second cylinder, again, just to get an idea, but uh, ring one and then this is ring two, this is with the old rings. And as you can see, they're pretty much the same. This is the amount of wear that's on the rings. So originally, I can only assume that they were in spec, and this is what they're now sitting at. 0 0.8, 0 0.73, 0 0.58, 0 0.6, 0 0.53, and 0 0.6. And again on ring two, 
they're pretty much the same as what the new Getz rings are. So there is a very appreciable level of wear on my original rings. And again, I'd obviously prefer that these were closer to spec. Now just out of curiosity, I did measure uh, the actual, how accurate this gauge is. And I did find with my micrometer that these are about 0 0.3, 0 0.03 of a millimeter oversized. So you could potentially trim 0 0.03 of a mil off all of these measurements. But even then it's still considerably outside spec but it's not a major issue. Now it's not ideal, but again, this is not a racing application. It's just a regular road car. There's potential for seeing ever so slight increased blow by. So that's basically gas is getting past the piston rings. There's an ever so slight chance of increased oil consumption. But in general, these uh, characteristics or ill characteristics generally aren't apparent uh, using the Getz piston rings. So many guys were, had the exact same concerns. And then when they actually run in the engine, 1,000 kilometers, 2,000 kilometers, 3,000 kilometers, there's no issues with them at all. Because the reality is that ring gap is only a part of the story, essentially, in terms of how pistons perform. It's just as important that you have a high quality ring. It's just as important that you have uh, a ring that has proper tensile properties, not like the ones, arguably, that are 30 years old. The funny thing is, I think the original rings are probably still okay but there's no doubt that there's going to be some tensile loss with the original rings. It's crucial as well that you have a high quality flat face. There's obviously going to be a level of wear on my own ones. And then you want to have a ring that has a minimal amount of chatter on the actual piston itself. And again, with the Getz piston rings, they're high quality units, so you're not going to get that. So, and then there's a few other characteristics as well. And like I mentioned, ring gap is only part of the story. So I'm not concerned in the slightest about these oversized uh, ring gaps these if anything I'm happy with how consistent they are and again I think they should bed in absolutely fine there is another element as well you are supposed to uh, measure the insertion gap of your profile gauge against the piston ring so the allowable amount so once you get your profile gauge and you insert it if I have one of my new pistons here one of my recently cleaned pistons when you insert your profile gauge against one of the new rings, you shouldn't be able to insert anything that's larger than 0.13 of a millimeter. I've inserted my profile gauge. I essentially install one of these ones that are wafer thin. They're like a piece of paper almost. And the largest I can get in this gap is about 0.08 to point, I say 0.06 to 0.08 of a millimeter. So there's zero wear on my actual pistons themselves. So I'm happy with the actual size of the grooves. Uh, one thing I'm, I'm slightly less happy about, I suppose, is this iron coating has worn, uh, again, very evenly and uniformly across all of the pistons. So it's not as if one particular piston is any worse than the rest, but there is a level of iron coating loss here. So that is essentially almost exposed aluminium. I'm not particularly concerned about this. Guys have these pistons in, these, in the M70s and they run for easily another 100,000 miles on top of what I already have. So again, it's one of those things, where do the costs stop? I mean, do you go for all new pistons, you get all new rods, into thousands and thousands of euro more. So I'm not going down that road. Uh, I'm not concerned about the wear on these walls, these skirts, uh, I think it's within an acceptable level. And um, so I'm happy to reuse them. So I don't really see an issue with that. So let's stick one of these rings into one of the cylinder bores, just to give you an idea of how I measure it. And then we can get these pistons finally installed. The very last set of rings I'm installing are of course for piston number six and this is cylinder number six. And it's important to note as well when I got all my measurements, I didn't just use the same ring in all of the cylinders, I used every respective set in each respective cylinder and got those measurements. So the actual ring that's going to be installed in each particular cylinder was measured in that cylinder to get the actual uh, end clearance as well. So that's the way I've been doing it. We're going to do the same here with the very last one. So as I mentioned, this is cylinder six for piston number six. Uh, this is ring number two, so my method is to basically just insert it into the actual cylinder board like that. I'm going to use piston number six. It still has the actual oil scraper ring installed, so I'm using that as a stopper. Just push down gently, and that's the ring now installed. Now I know from my previous measurements on my sheet that these rings are producing in and around a gap of 0.6 to 0.7 or so. So I'm just going to whip out, say, 0.63 straight away insert so that's still a little bit loose that's 0 0.63 
So I'm just going to move on to 0.65 and you're just basically checking for a level of tightness. So that's pretty tight. Uh, I think the next jump is 0.7. Yeah, so that's probably going to be, it's probably not going to go in. But it might just about, let's see. It does. So that's very tight. So 0.7 is the measurement for number two, which is in line with the rest, 0.7 mil. We're going to do the same for ring number one. This is quite easy to remove, so basically just hinge it up, push them together, and lift it out. We're going to pop that back in, keep it safe. And now we're going to go with compression ring one, which is a much tougher ring. Um, now what I'd like to do with this is get about three-fifths of the ring installed or so, like so. And then just install the final tang and push it in. These do have an orientation as well. They're actually labeled top, so I have the top facing up. And again, I just insert my piston, slide it down. And again, we're aiming for it probably in around 0.65 or so. So let's get 0.65, see how that is. So 0.65 just about pushes in there. So that's quite tight. So I just know straight away from previous experience, this is definitely sitting around 0.65. So that's how I've been measuring them. I'm getting very consistent results. So let's install this very last set on my last piston. Here we go, the final set of piston rings. So GET separates all three of them in the packaging into three separate compartments and the specific instructions for each one. And we're gonna start here with the oil scraper ring. So we're gonna separate it into its two separate components, which is this rubber lined ring and then the outer ring. So we want to separate this to give ourselves a bit more room. So you can do that by pulling it apart like that. That makes the ring larger, so it slips over the top nice and easy. And then we can kind of collapse it again, like so. Now all we have to do is install the ring on top of it, but it's important that the gap is on the opposite side of where this join is, so 180 degrees. What I like to do is keep this section just here on the edge of this pin. Therefore, I know on the pin on the opposite side is where I need my ring gap. Now, this is actually omnidirectional. It doesn't matter which way up it goes, but there is a tiny little stamp on it, which is here. And I like to have that facing up like the stamps on the other two. So like I say, this isn't critical, but I just like to do it. So everything is uniform. So like I say, I want this to be on the opposite side of this split and I just install it gently like that. So it probably won't line up perfectly, but we just insert the rubber line section, the spring section underneath, and that is all nicely installed. And I like to just do a quick spin and make sure that it's properly seated on top of the inner section, which it is. So now we can move on to ring two, and this very much has an orientation, so this is marked top, and we're going to install this on groove two. So I kind of like to plant it on top like this, and then just separate it. And I just run it down until it hits groove number two, and that's it installed in groove number two. And then the last ring is of course compression ring number one and this is the really tough one and again this is marked top also so i'm going to plant this on top and once again just spread it with my cheapo ring ring spreaders and that's it installed now it's important that you don't have all your ring gaps lined up perfectly like this, that's a big no-no, especially for the first startup. You basically want them to be evenly spaced. I kind of split the piston into thirds. So I'm gonna rotate the middle one to over here. The bottom one is over here. So I want the top one to be over here. So they're all nice and evenly spaced. And it's as easy as that.
As you can see I've just laid out all the parts I need to get the pistons installed and I'm going to be installing them in pairs. So you can see I've got piston number 7 here and piston number 1 and they're both going to be installed at the same time because they both share the same journal. So this is cylinder 1, that's cylinder 7 and I'm going to work my way back in pairs down the engine block starting at the front. In terms of lubrication I'm going to use the same paste that I was using on the main bearings. That's going to be used uh, on the rod bearings themselves. And then I'm using a regular 10W40 oil on the actual pistons and cylinder bores themselves. In terms of the bearings, I have all the red bearings that I need. I have all the blue bearings that I need. The reds sit in the cap itself. And then the blues sit in the upper rod section itself. And as you can see, the very faint uh, outline of the different colours on the side of the bearings there. I've already done my measurements uh, with plastic gauge. I've worked my way all the way down the crank. I'm very happy with the clearances that I got. They are well within spec. So I'm just using the standard uh, 45 mil size. I'm not going uh, oversized in any kind of way. So, yep, ready to roll. Uh, I'm going to get these bearings lubricated up and I'm going to get the actual pistons lubed and then we can install them into the block. So let's get started. I'm going to start with piston 7. Just going to give everything a one last clean. But then one red. And just paint the bearing on the inside. Perfect. I'm just going to oil up the inside of the cylinder bore. Here's my ring compressor that came with the ring removal tool and I'm just going to lube this up as well. Small bit of oil. I'm going to leave it facing up so I can adjust it. And of course we need to lubricate our piston. Make sure the oil gets right down underneath the rings and make sure that our end gaps are in the correct location once more. And then we're going to insert it into our ring compressor. I like to adjust it just so the bottom of the skirts are showing and then we can tighten it down. Perfect. Before we slide in the piston, I just want to make sure my crank is rotated to the position that you see here so that the journal is at the furthest point away from the pistons. That way when you're banging in the piston, there's no chance of it hitting off the journal and it's quite easy to pull the piston up to the journal. So that's why it's in the position that it is. All 12 of the cylinders have this arrow on the top and that shows the orientation of the piston inside the block itself. It should always be pointing forwards to the front of the engine so that's very important that you follow that direction. When you're dropping the piston in I suppose you can make an extra effort to make sure that the bottom of the connecting rod here is protected so it doesn't you know do any damage to the cylinder wall. What I find if you rotate the block to this kind of angle whereby the deck is perfectly flat and horizontal in all planes it just kind of floats down the middle of the cylinder and even if it taps off the cylinder wall it's all lubricated up it's a super hard surface it's not going to do any damage in the slightest so let's just slide this down that's it seated on the top I want to make sure my arrow is lined up which it now is I'm going to make sure that my spring compressor or my ring compressor is perfectly flat on the deck which it now is and I want to keep a kind of firm pressure so it doesn't pop up in any way and then at the same time tap the piston into place it should go in nice and easily like that perfect you can tap the piston down a little bit further and that's not going anywhere we can safely spin the actual block upside down and just do it slowly so the actual connecting rod doesn't flop about. And that's it fully upside down. And I can slowly pull the piston towards me. 
and kind of offer it up to the journal itself. And that's it, it seats nicely against the crank. I have my cap ready to go, all greased up. We've got the red bearing installed. Make sure we have the orientation correct and gently insert it into the piston. I forgot to mention my bolts earlier on when I was laying out all the gear to get this job done. We have of course the brand new bolts from BMW. These are stretch bolts, single use. Uh, of course you need to leave the coating on these but I find there's virtually no coating on it at all. So again I'm going to put a very small bit of lubrication on these bolts and just wipe off any ex excess just to make sure it's done correctly. And for now I'm just going to leave these finger tight. And we can move on to the next piston. I have piston number 7 prepped and the same thing again, make sure the arrow is pointing forwards and gently drop it down into the cylinder bore. That's properly lined up and we just need to fully drop it in. There we go. It needs to be twisted ever so slightly and then tap it in. There we go, number seven. And two fresh bolts. Torque spec for connected rod bolts is 5 newton meters, then 20 newton meters, and then 70 degrees. And 20. Let's zero it out at zero, and then 70 degrees. Let's spin it back upright. Just giving it another bit of lubrication. And let's turn it over. Lovely and smooth. Now we're back to cylinder number two. We're just going to line it up and drop it in. Lovely.
And lastly we have piston number 12. I've been alternating between techniques, I find tapping it from the underside also works quite well. Done. Of course we need to give it a quick turn by hand. Look at that. How's this for timing guys? The very next day my heads have arrived back from Poland. So these were sent off, if you all remember, back in, I think it was the end of August last year, 2023. And I sent them off to Topmar in Poland. And it was quite a lengthy process, primarily because my heads were in such poor condition. So the cams were in very, very poor condition, to the point that they are unrepairable. Now, there's a chance they were repairable, but with extensive work required, there was no sense in doing so. I essentially sourced two cams from the USA from Ed in B12 Throttle in California. They came from uh, his 850 which only had something like 70,000 miles. So they're the cams that I went with. So I have two of his cams which he gladly sold me. Where am I going to put all this? Oh yeah. Look at this. Head number one. one of the original cams. Wow, 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 wow. Here we go guys, both the heads are now laid out on the table and you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. I got so excited, I actually cut my finger trying to open up the parcels. But oh my goodness, look at the condition of these heads. They are like new. The guys in Topmar did an absolutely unbelievable job. So let's just run through the different components here. Uh, so as I mentioned, I sourced two replacement used, but very, very good condition cams from Ed in V12 Throttle in California. These came from his 70K odd mile M70. And as you can see, the camshafts are in a, like a brand new condition. It made no sense at all trying to repair and refurbish my ones. They're just so badly scored. These are essentially like brand new, as you can see. Absolutely top condition. And in regards to the rocker arms, I went with Colbin Schmidt ones, um, a top uh, OEM brand. Um, yeah, it just, again, made no sense because there's so much damage to the actual cams. Uh, th that meant that the rockers actually had a lot of damage as well. So I went with all new rockers as well. Again, incredibly expensive. If I went through the dealer, they would have been insane money. So I went aftermarket with Auto Dock. Uh, with Colman Smith rockers and then the hydraulic lifters I went with uh, INA tappets now again trying to source those tappets was an absolute nightmare auto dock basically took my money took my order and then told me they didn't have them so uh, they refunded me in full so I basically got I think it was a combination of five separate orders of basically like four here six there eight here um, and it's basically all new old stock essentially that i got from various ebay sellers from all around europe uh, some of the stuff looked like it was literally 20 years old but in a new condition so they're all brand new matching ina tappets so that's what i have inside the actual heads now as well so let me just flip one of these over and we'll take a look at the valves and as you can see top class job so these are the original valves all fully refurbished 
and in top top condition the heads have been skimmed as well uh, I think they were skimmed to 0.1 of a millimeter so the allowable uh, on the M70 heads is maximum of 0.2 so they look really really good as well so cannot wait to get these installed and we'll do so in the next video Oh, I'm so glad that video is finally over. So I'm fully aware that that video kind of spiraled out of control. The runtime is just insane. I had no intention of this video being as long as it is. I suppose that's the way all my videos seem to end up, incredibly long format. But I do hope that the level of detail is useful to some people because I don't think anyone's covered the bottom end build of an M70 before. I'm also fully aware that Sretton over on M539 uh, Restorations, he's after releasing his full M70 engine build which is fantastic for me, I suppose, in some ways, because it means I don't have to spend as much time detailing the reassembly of this engine. There's no point in me covering all the same stuff twice. So I really hope I can fly through this engine because in reality, the recording and trying to sound somewhat knowledgeable and doing all the research is slowing me down a tremendous amount. Uh, I just love to be able to come in here and not record anything and build the engine and it'd be so much faster. So I'm just gonna kind of summarize the build of the engine. It's gonna be a whole lot shorter for the next video. Um, and I just hope that everything that I covered in this video is useful to somebody else. Uh, I also have some great news in regarding the bodywork. If you want to take a look at this B-roll footage, I'm after sourcing, not sourcing, purchasing at considerable expense, brand new body panels from BMW. So I bought two front wings and two rear kind of uh, C-pillar sections, the entire uh, rear third of the car on both sides. So these came straight from uh, BMW in Germany. Just as a point of note, quite interesting in terms of front wings and in terms of rear rings. So those, well, the rear sections, there's only like 79 of them left in existence. And the front wings, there's only about 40 each left in existence, even less now as far, I'm aware, as, as, far as I am aware. So if you want to get some, I'd snap them up pretty soon because there won't be many left for long. So I, instead of going down the route of repairing those panels, which is going to cost me at least half the value of those panels, uh, I just got all new panels and they'll just be bolt on. Well, apart from the rear sections, it's going to be a considerable amount of work to get them fitted. But anyway, that's all going to be covered in the next video. Hopefully I've done a bit more or made a bit more progress in regards to the body work. And if you haven't already, please hit the bell on the bottom. Please give me a subscribe, my subscriptions, because my videos are so intermittent and so long in between the releases. Uh, my subscriptions are kind of dropped off a bit. So if you give me a subscribe, that really help me out. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.